Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, an iHeart Radio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you so very much for being part of our beautiful Reading with Your Kids family and helping us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at Jedly Magic on Twitter, at reading with your kids on Instagram. Our guest today is Mark Binder. He is here to celebrate the Groston Rules. He's also going to share some great tips to how we can animate our story time. Before we invite Mark into the studio, I want to uh, share with you a little public service announcement. Um, We are publishing this episode of the podcast on March 5th, 2021. It has almost been one full year since the uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 lockdown uh, began here in the United States. I know in other parts of the world it it began earlier. Things are getting better, uh, and, and things are getting better because most of us have been out there cooperating. We've been socially, keeping socially distant from each other. We've been wearing our masks. We've been washing our hands, sanitizing our hands. Right now, it's it's time for folks to get the vaccine. I just had my first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, and I, I want to let you know it was a, 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 a great experience. Uh, the, the folks at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center here in Boston did an absolutely wonderful job. The, um, the vaccine clinic that they put together was just phenomenal. Um, there was no problems at all. Very efficient. The people there were wonderful. I had no uh, adverse effect, uh, no adverse uh, effects from the first dose of the vaccine. I thought I might have felt a little tired, but I also might have psyched myself out. Uh, the, the second dose will be administered to me in about a week, week and a half. And, and again, I just want to encourage everybody out there. Thank you so much for what you've been doing so far. And uh, continue to wear the mask, continue to sanitize, continue to stay six feet apart from each other. But also right now, as soon as you have an opportunity to get the vaccine, I want to encourage you to go for it. Joining us right now from the great state of Rhode Island. He's actually right down the road from our studios here in Reedville. He's here to celebrate the Groston rules and also talk to us a little bit about uh, 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 making our story time, making our read alongs with our kids a little bit more animated and fun. Please welcome to the show, Mark Binder. Mark, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Jed. Really excited to have you here. Mark is an author and also a, um, a, a really celebrated and acclaimed storyteller. It's been an interesting time since COVID. <laughs> well, yeah, that was one of the questions I was going to have. Um, being someone that presents educational magic shows, uh, this is a tough time. I haven't been able to be in front. I, I was in front of uh, two days in the summertime. I uh, went out and performed at camps for small, teeny groups of kids around the camp and was moving around these big outdoor spaces. But for the most part, I haven't had um, a, a typical in-person audience uh, since February. It has been challenging. I've been, I've had, um, I was actually on tour in Europe when COVID hit. Um, just before I left in March, people were saying, aren't you worried about going abroad? But here in Rhode Island was actually one of the first places in the country where COVID started and it came about two days before I left. So I figured it's on both sides of the ocean. There's nothing I can do. I might as well enjoy my trip. Got in about two thirds of the tour in I did I was in Vienna and then in London I got all those dates done and then when I got to Copenhagen uh, my last shows were on the Thursday the 12th and they all got canceled Mm -hmm. so they shut down the whole government a little bit different than they did it here yeah yeah it's a a challenging time and, and I hope everybody uh, keeps keeps in mind that you know there are so many people out of work and, and the folks that, that are you know 
that we know about are the you know the restaurant workers and the, the chefs and and all of those folks, but people in the arts have been really hit hard uh, by by COVID and the restrictions, and it's going to continue. It's going to be a long time before folks are back at concerts and library events and uh, school assemblies and, and and things like that. Well, let's get to, down, uh, get to your book, The Groston Rules. This is a book for adults and um, older teenagers? Yes, adults and young adults. Uh, the Groston Rules is a project I started way back in the old days of 2017. I, as a writer, I love doing serializations. Um, I did a novel called The Brothers Schlemiel almost 30 years ago, and I've been doing a lot of stuff for kids and families for the last 20 years. I wanted to do something different. And the Groston Rules began as a podcast, or actually I like to think of it as the first novel to be serialized on Spotify. (laughs) Every week, starting January 1st, 2018, I released a new chapter. And I was writing it, I was recording it, and then editing and then releasing it. Uh, once a week, and the idea was to do something that was not (laughs) (laughs) child-appropriate. I had no idea. When I write a serial, I have a rough idea of what I want, but I don't tend to plan out the whole thing. The premise is, is, is relatively simple. It starts on New Year's Eve, although when I began to rewrite the book, I realized that it didn't necessarily have to start, and there was all sorts of it started on New Year's Eve because I was releasing the first episode on New Year's Eve, and I thought that would be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. But the book begins with a flashback. There are seven uh, high school seniors who are graduating. Um, there's Adam and Isaac. Isaac is the narrator. There's uh, uh, Charlie. There's Helen, Sean, Jesus. I'm missing somebody. Oh, and Rover. Rover, of course. Everything happens in Rover's basement. So it's kind of like this. They're all on their way to graduate. There's, we, we, the first scene is called Cut to the Chase, and it's a real short thing. They're on their way to graduation, and then it flashes back to New Year's Eve. And New Year's Eve was sort of the last time where life was normal for them. Uh, that shortly after that, things just start to fall apart. All of their hopes and dreams get interrupted by, um, well, there's a big flood. Um, It's also, their school gets shut down. This is before COVID. And there's bullying and violence. But the story is really about a bunch of young people who come together and work together to get through this stuff. It's not a typical YA book. There aren't any vampires. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, – there's some gratuitous drug abuse, but it's, not, it's more like um, – I'm going to be straight here. It's more like the kind of thing that, that a lot of parents remember from their teenage years. Um, the group was based on the friends of my children. We had this whole bunch of guys and one girl – who hung out all the time. And as parents, I never heard about their problems. You know, there's a lot of stories out there about kids and their parents and they're fighting and it's a whole thing and the parents come, you know. And these kids just solved their problems. I thought that was really cool. So I took these characters that I've been working with for years. I wrote a couple of books that are for younger people, one called It Ate My Sister, and the other called The Zombie Cat. And I took all the characters from those who were set in the past, and I I wrote these books sort of as fictional autobiographies. I rebooted them. I brought them into uh, the present, so it's set in, well, it's now the past, Mm -hmm. um, set in 2018, and uh, made them 17 and 18 years old instead of uh, elementary through middle school. Mm -hmm. So it became this book for high school students and for adults and for maybe upper middle school students that's completely different, I think, than many, many young adult books out there. It's just a really fun read. Yeah. 
And, and it sounds like it would be a, a fun read, a fun book for a family to co-read and, and, and talk about and have conversations about on the way to school or where, wherever, you know, the, the kids might be driving their parents. I suppose when the audiobook comes out, that might work. <laughs> I've been uh, recording the audio. That's one other project recording. It's a it's a 380 page book, and and I've never uh, recorded something that long, so that's been challenging. I you know, the the honest person in me says the odds of young people and parents being in a car talking about my novel is so close to zero. <laughs> it would be nice to think. Um, I it I think that I just think that kids will read this book and go, yeah, it's like that, and the parents will read this book and go, why aren't you like that? And the kids go, like, eh, we are like that. You just keep asking us the wrong questions. <laughs> One of the things I absolutely wanted to speak to you about is, you know, you are a, a master storyteller and you have the ability to use your voice to captivate an, an audience. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you're one of those people that we used to hear about that could pick up the phone book, which was this thing that we used in the olden days that had everybody's <laughs> phone number in it, uh, and that you could pick it up and read it and, and, and you know, grab folks' attention uh, just reading the, those names and numbers and addresses. How can we as parents not, you know, aspire to get to your level of storytelling, but how can we make the, the time that we're spending reading to our kids, reading with our kids, more animated and more fun and more engaging? There's there's two ways to look at that, and let me talk about the... So I, I've, I've done a program over the years called Telling and Reading Stories with Children. Uh, one of my first books was called The Bedtime Storybook, and that book is a bunch of mostly classic stories, but with some tips at the beginning of each uh, story and some essays on how to read to read with children. I like to say it's reading with children rather than reading mm -hmm. to children. But something that I observed while I was working on the book was my mom reading to my kids, and she was horrible. <laughs> I mean, I love my mom, but it was like not animated. It was none of that stuff, but it didn't matter to the kids. Because the kids were all snuggled. So one of the things that I say, especially with younger kids, is is snuggle with them. Have them sitting next to you. You know, the physical presence makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, the other is uh, using voices is not that difficult. The only thing you have to be careful of is is once, especially with really young kids, once you pick a voice, you're kind of stuck with that voice for that particular character. Mm -hmm. But it's really easy to change voices. I mean, you know, pitch in voice. So, you know, I was walking down the street. I was walking down the street. Two different characters. Mm -hmm. Tempo. Um, I was walking down the street. I was walking down the street. You can play with those things. Mm -hmm. But the performance, the performance component of it is less important than the habit of it. If if it's going to make you nuts to try to animate something, don't don't get stuck by that. You know, do whatever's easiest and works best. On the other hand, it can be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. You know, to make noises, to 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 take. So, oh, the other thing that people don't think about are the pauses and taking your time. So it's not just the, the speed at which a character talks. It's taking the time to allow suspense mm -hmm. to build just a little. And then you move on. You know, I'm just playing a little bit right now. Sure. Storytelling is, you know, one of the things we haven't acknowledged yet, the storytelling is the oldest form of communication and, and teaching. It's how I would say second song probably goes before. Okay, that, but go okay. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as the future for storytelling? Okay, so the word storytelling in the last five years, seven years, has changed. When I started 
being a performance storyteller, nobody had ever heard of storytelling. Um, and I hadn't even heard of it until I did. Uh, I grew up in Maryland and we didn't have storytellers down there. New England, it turns out, is a little bit of a hotbed. In the last seven to ten years, the word storytelling has had several meanings. There's, there's the live performance storyteller, which still most people don't know about. Mm-hmm. There's Everything is called storytelling now in um, any kind of entertainment media. Oh, this person's a great storyteller. Mm-hmm. This person, this film is a great storytelling. Uh, and then the other thing that storytelling has become is uh, we're trying to sell you something. Mm-hmm. We're going to use this. We're going to use a story to tell you something, sell you something. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what you're asking, though, is... <clears throat> How are we going to use storytelling now? I, I think it's going to go back. I, some of it, as soon as you know, as I don't think I don't think we're going back. I don't want to go back. Mm-hmm. I want to go forward. I want to take some of the things that used to work and do those again, and I want to keep some of the things that really do work and keep using those. When my family got together after Thanksgiving. Uh, we had a family thing with my huge family, and then we had a smaller thing with just my uh, immediate family on Zoom. Mm-hmm. And everybody was just talking. It was like an after-dinner conversation where we didn't have to sit together to have dinner. Mm-hmm. And the advantage of that is there was no rush. There was no t- TikTok. Everybody was just hanging out. Um, we're going to use storytelling I don't I see I don't I don't use storytelling in that way. For me I tell stories, well straight up I tell stories cuz people ask me to. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I tell a story cuz I think it's an important one. For example, one of the stories that I used to tell during the reign of King George II and started telling again during the Trump administration is the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. And this story is not a true story. Uh, everybody knows the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. If you don't, basically George Washington sees his father's cherry tree. He's a little kid. He chops it down with his hatchet. And I make a big deal about how kids used to have hatchets back in the old days. And he chops down the tree. And then he realizes what he's done. And in my version, he hides. He hides under the front porch. And his father sees the tree and realizes what is likely to happen, knows where George is hiding, sits down and says, you know, I wonder who chopped down my cherry tree. I wonder if it was one of the slaves. Because George Washington had slaves. Mm -hmm. And hearing this, George comes out and he says, you know, the line is, Father, I, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down your cherry tree. And his dad goes, Son, I'm proud of you. For chopping down the tree? No, for two reasons. First of all, you didn't lie to me. But second, and more important, you took responsibility for your actions. And that takes this old story that was invented by this fellow named Parson Weems, who to, to, to was who was mytho- creating a mythology about George Washington, mm-hmm. and it takes this story that is not a contemporary story, brings in elements that we are more aware of today. Uh, you know, tobacco. I mentioned tobacco. I mentioned uh, the hatchet. I mentioned slavery. None of which is in the original story. Mm-hmm. And then the not telling a lie thing is very important. Um, certainly in an era of, of the idea that, that news can be fake and that science is not somehow suspect. Um, but the idea that, that a president should be responsible for his actions struck me as the most important lesson. So retelling old stories is a way of taking ownership of the past and creating the future that you want. Hmm. That's 
fascinating and a, and a challenge, I think, um, for all of us. Yeah. yeah. But it's not that hard. I mean, it, it can be as simple as, you know, I saw this guy at the supermarket who wasn't wearing a mask. And I got so mad, you know. Well, okay, why are you mad? You know, look, I don't know. Let's not go down that tunnel. <laughs> Forget that. By Hopefully by the time you hear this, the, the, the vaccine will be out and people will be breathing sighs of relief. I still think we've got a ways to go. I, I think we have a ways to go, too. And hopefully we're going to go together. Hopefully we're going to learn uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, about each other and, and learn to have more empathy. And can I can I throw in two more things? Sure. All right. Um, first thing that I want to throw out to parents about reading, and I noticed this. I wrote a book called Cinderella Spinderella. It was based on a performance story. When I tell the story of Cinderella, first of all, I don't look anything like Cinderella. So I know that people probably aren't seeing me as Cinderella. But I was telling the story to kids in the Boston area through this program called Read Boston, all different ethnic backgrounds. And I was telling the same stories uh, in the summer in Newport to these disabled young people. So I, I created this story of Cinderella, who's in a wheelchair. It's called Cinderella Spinderella. And when it came time to illustrate the book, the illustrator we worked with, uh, we had five different versions. There was a, a black, a white, Hispanic, Asian, and South Asian. And we created an ebook that allowed people to pick what Cinderella looked like mm. and uh, to pick what the prince looked like. And it wasn't just like, didn't just change skin tone. It changed her characteristics as well. Mm-hmm. This was, I forget when, 2013, maybe. Um, I found that parents didn't want to buy ebooks for their children mm-hmm. because somehow that was more screen time. And I've observed since then, I don't know that this has changed yet. And this is something I think parents actually need to really think about. We are teaching our young people that physical books are for kids. Digital stuff is for adults. Hmm. You'll give the kid a book and tell them to read, and then you'll look at your phone or your iPad or your Kindle or your laptop. And we don't encourage kids to read long form on these devices. There's, I love books. I love the physicality of books. I love the fact that a book is one thing and only one thing. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the really advantages of it. But unless we model for our children reading long form on devices, Mm -hmm. as soon as they get old enough to, you know, they they don't want the book, they want the device. And the device is is, uh, uh, a distraction machine. Mm -hmm. So we need to teach them how to not be distracted, how to how to have longer focus on these machines. So that that's something that I'm very, very adamant about. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating, because I I'm only reading on devices these days. Yep. Um, it, it, it just makes I, – I, I, too, miss – you know, I, I, I love the, the books and holding books in my hand. But just from, you know, the practicality of, you know, reading at the gym with, you know, trying to do that with a paperback or a hardback, it, it, it was – I did it for many years, but uh, so much easier on a device. Um, but it's just I, – I just love the fact that I have this – this thing that that will fit in my um, in my backpack, and and I can literally carry a library full of books with me everywhere I go. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And you said there was two. There, there was yep. there another the other, thing. The other wanted? thing is, I really do want to encourage people to go out and get my book, The Groston Rules. Yes. It's a it's a lovely. Pretty much as soon as it came out, I realized it was no longer contemporary fiction, but historical fiction because it is about a time that is no more, Mm. Um, 2018. Yeah. (laughs) Um, At the same time, it's a a lovely, and as I was reading it out loud, uh, you know, doing the audio book recording, I kept being struck. This happens to me. 
I read, I was reading, I was like, wow, this is really good. I wonder what happens next. I hope I didn't screw up the ending. <laughs> and I was, I was very pleased when I got to the end. I was like, no, I nailed it. Yay. Um, so for those of you who are listening, the, the Groston Rules, uh, is a really fun book. It's appropriate for, I would say, um, ninth grade and up. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, some advanced seventh and eighth graders might enjoy it, but it's, it, the publishers make you, any book that has 17 and 18 year old characters, there's this like stamp that goes on that says, this is a young adult book. Mm. And I know that adults, some adults will look at that and go, ah, it's, a, it's for young adults. Like, no, I wrote this book for adults and the fact that young adults will enjoy it is bonus. Mm-hmm. Or I wrote this book for young adults and adults will enjoy it as bonus. It, it works both ways. Yeah. Well, one of the things you mentioned earlier on is your love of, of performing for intergenerational audiences. I have mm-hmm. that same love. Um, I know. Magic's a great thing for that. Yeah. And, and I know that there. And my, my wife's originally from Puerto Rico. I know, I know in Latin culture it's much more common to see generations come together to attend a concert or an event or um, be at a party together. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that here in the States we can start understanding that, that we all have things to, to offer to one another, especially, uh, you know, old, old, old folks like me can learn f- from, from young folks and get some energy from them. And I think that I have some wisdom that I can pass on. So uh, let's start breaking down some of those generational barriers and, and st- starting to come together. Absolutely. Yeah. Mark, where can folks go to learn more about everything that you're doing? Because you, there's a lot going on in the world of Mark Binder. Yes, I I keep making stuff. Uh, and, I, and I don't always do the same thing over and over again, which is uh, a marketing nightmare. <laughs> um, MarkBinderBooks.com. It's M-A-R-K-B-I-N-D-E-R. Books.com is my website. Uh, the books are available the Gross and Rules is on Amazon. It's on iBooks. Google Playbooks is one that I really like. Um, Kobo, Nook. Um, the audiobooks are out on Audible and pretty much everywhere else that audiobooks are sold. Some of my stuff is on Spotify. You can actually tune. In fact, follow me on Spotify. Uh, one of the cool things about Spotify is it lets you know when something is new is when something new is coming out, and I release something on Spotify every month or so, whether it's a short story or a longer piece. Um, so that's those are sort of the things. Markbinderbooks.com. Uh, I local bookstores will buy my books. They don't tend to carry them because their their model has changed mm-hmm. over the last few years. It's it's a it's a different landscape for writers yep. these days. So yep. Let's not get into that dark tunnel. <laughs> but, but one of the things that we, we, we suggest folks to do, that if they do want to support their local independent bookstore, just go in, make a request, or these days pick up the phone, make a request. They'll get the book to you in two or three days. Yes. I, local bookstores are a valuable, valuable thing. And, I, I, again, this is the difference between digital and analog. If you go into a regular bookstore, in a matter of 15 or 20 minutes – you can browse 500 titles. You may not realize that you're doing it. You're looking at this shelf of books and you're reading these titles and you're seeing these authors and it all happens instantaneously. Mm-hmm. To look at 500 titles on Amazon's website, you're probably going to walk away with a pair of boots instead. <laughs> I think two words have never been said. (laughs) I do miss those days of of crawling around, and it was crawling around the 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 floors of a bookstore. Those were wonderful days. Um, And maybe I I I I was going to say maybe they'll come back. I don't think they'll come back. But we want everybody to make sure that they come back to the Reading with Your Kids podcast and, and also t- make take time to check out the Groston Rules by our guest, Mark Binder. Mark, this has been fascinating. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks so very much for having me, Jen. 
Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We're going to have a great time speaking with the Lee family. You've met John and Shireen Lee here on the podcast. They were here to celebrate the Joy Sun Bear series. They're going to be joined on the next episode by their daughter, their 11-year-old daughter, Aaliyah, who's amazing. And they're going to be celebrating their pandemic workbook. This is a really... Um, I think it can be a really important addition to your family library. It can really make a difference uh, in your family and uh, help your kids talk about a lot of the feelings they may, may be having during this very difficult time for all of us. It might help you talk about some of your feelings during this very difficult time. That's the next episode of the podcast. I want to thank everybody who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Mark Binder. Please be sure to check out the Groston Rules. I also want to give a special thanks to my my team. Um, Alexia Brown, our amazing intern, uh, helped uh, piece this podcast together. So big, big thanks to Alexia. I also want to thank Alejandra Doherty, Fatima Khan, and our other great intern, Hannah Pat Oboiski. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.